campus. And so if you still want to be a part of a life group and you went, oh, I forgot to sign up, I didn't get a chance to do that, uh, then come and see me. We'll make sure that you get on. I know we got one life group that's full and another one that's almost totally full, uh, but we'd love for you to get in, plugged in if at all possible. And I think tonight the life groups that are meeting off campus are, uh, uh, one of them is doing a little bit of a Super Bowl party and one of them's having uh, their uh, life group just before the Super Bowl to kind of get that out of the way. Men, we got something for you guys. Uh, we have a men's ministry outing coming up February the 9th. That's not this coming Monday, but the following Monday. Uh, we are, you know, sometimes us guys, when we get together, we get together, we'll eat, uh, we'll get together, we'll uh, go to the gun range, or we'll shoot ski, or something like that. But we also have a softer side to ourselves. And so we're going to do that this Monday. And might I add, gentlemen, that, uh, that Valentine's Day is at the end of that week. So at the front end of the week, we're going to do a thing that we're calling letters. And this is an opportunity for us as men to sit down and to write some thank you notes, inspirational notes, encouragement notes, maybe even some, even if you want to, some love letters to your brides, uh, just to say thank you for all that they've done for us in the past, to be able to encourage those around us. You could be, you could write, you could write notes to, uh, to uh, uh, your your brides. You could write write notes to friends. You could write notes to people that you know that are sick that need encouragement. We're just going to get together. There's a format we're going to go through, so you won't have to you don't have to come bring us a th the source or anything like that. Uh, we, we've got a, a format we're going to use. We'll all come together, and we'll also have a, a chili supper that night as well. So I encourage you if you would love to be a part of that. We just need to know how much to plan for. And so if you'll sign the sign-up sheet that's right outside these doors in the connections counter, that'll greatly help us out. But that'll be February 9th at 6.30, I believe. I think it says 7 on the screen, but I think we're going to meet a half hour early because we are having chili. So uh, we're going to have a good time with that. Finally, I um, just want to encourage you. We are in day 26 of our 40 days of prayer. Encourage you to continue to stay strong. We're on the home stretch. We've got 14 days left. Not that we'll stop praying after that, uh, but yet nonetheless, we want to encourage you uh, to continue to, uh, to pray strong uh, as, we, uh, as we finish out these 40 days of prayer coming up in a couple weeks. Well, listen, it's great to see you here. It's great to be here. We have a great day of worship planned, and I'm just going to simply bow before the Lord, and let's just pray. Let's thank Him for what He's done for us today. Father God, we give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. Lord, we are in awe of you, and Lord, we revere who you are the very person of you, Lord God. The fact that you, you are so powerful and so awesome and so mighty, and yet also, too, you are full of love and compassion and grace and mercy. How can that be? I don't know. But, Lord God, wrapped in that, wrapped in that exterior of, of being the King of kings, the Lord of lords, is a, is a Heavenly Father who loves us and cares for us. And, Lord, we just say thank you for who you are. We are here today to honor you, to honor your person, to honor what you've done for us. And so, Father God, we pray that that would happen as we pray to you, as we sing to you, uh, as we gather around communion and, and think about what you've done for us. And as we hear your, hear your sermon today, Father, we pray uh, that you would be lifted up and that you would be glorified. It's in your powerful name we pray all these things. Amen. Well, listen, while you guys are here, I want you guys to stand up and let's greet each other as a church, let people know how great it is to see them here today.
chest. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Stand to your feet and let's praise God together. And let's ask him to open the eyes of our heart so that we may see him high and lifted up. Amen. See him as he is. And we can worship him even the more. Sing, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, let's sing that one more time, open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, I want to see you, I want to see you, sing open the eyes, yeah, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, see you high. Shining in the light of your glory See you high, see you high, lifted up, shining in the light, shining in the light of the glory. Pour out your power in love, pour out your power in love. As we sing, as we sing, holy, holy, holy. I want to see you high, lifted up, shining in the light, shining in the light of the glory. Pour out your power in love.
sing holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. One more time, sing holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Guys, sing. Open the eyes, sing. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. One more time, one more time, sing. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, sing. Everybody come on and lift him up, yeah. 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 Lift him up, 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 lift him up. Lord, I lift, Lord, I lift your name on high. problem that we think we're getting ready to face, God. We lift you up higher than that, Lord, and we focus on you because we know, God, you will take it and work it out for our good. That's how much you love us, God, and we thank you in advance for that, and we just want to stop and think about just what you've done for us as we sing. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. 
I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and you rose again. Come on, let's sing that one more time. Sing it. Sing, sing it to him. I'm forgiven. Amazing love, sing this. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, sing. Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy, and it's my joy to honor. Sing, I'm forgiven again. Sing that. Yes, I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. Yes, I'm accepted. Yeah. I'm accepted. You were condemned. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Yeah. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and you rose again. Amazing love for singing strong sing. Amazing love, how can it be? You my king, that you my king would die for me. Amazing love, amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy, yeah, it's my joy to honor. sing this to him and sing, you are my king. You are my king. Sing you. You are my king. Jesus, you. Jesus, you are my
Uh, CCF could not exist if it were not for the supporting churches like Mount Carmel and the generous people like yourselves that make the work that we do possible. I just want to take a couple of minutes and just give you a real quick update of what your support is doing. Uh, rest assured, it is changing lives on a daily basis. Uh, things at CCF are going really well. Last school year, our Thursday night worship gathering uh, averaged about 85 students. Last fall, the, the fall semester, we had more Thursday nights with over 100 students than nights we had less than 100 students. So things are going really, uh, really well. We had two great retreats last semester. We're gearing up for our winter retreat this upcoming uh, weekend. We'll be up in the North Carolina mountains. Uh, we've got about 54 students uh, signed up for that, so we're really excited uh, about that. Things are going really, really well. Just real quick, I want to tell you about our freshman class because I'm really excited about them. At, at Campus Ministries, when it comes to freshmen, you see some freshmen once or twice, you see some every now and then, but we have this group of about 10 to 12 that they've decided CCF's going to be their home, and that's what we want, and, and they've really... Uh, just embraced CCF. They've decided it's going to be their home away from home during their time at Georgia. I was meeting with one of our freshman men a couple weeks ago, and I asked him, I said, well, you're a semester in. What do you think? He said, well, I think I'll be here for four years. I didn't have the heart to tell him it'll probably be five or six, but <laughs> if, if you're here the whole time, that's fine. Uh, two of our freshman girls have already decided that they're going to live in the campus house next year. We have uh, rooms upstairs where, where 10 of our female students can live, and we already have two freshman girls who decided they're going to live in the house, so that speaks well. So things are going really, really well. God's taken good care of CCF for a number of years. Our past speaks to that. Our present speaks to him continuing to bless us, and with these awesome freshmen, uh, our future is really bright. Please know you are a part of that, and I could stand up here for hours and just say thank you, and it would not be enough, but thank you for all that you do uh, to make what we do at CCF possible. Would you pray with me, please? God, I thank you for Mount Carmel Christian Church. I thank you for their heart for missions. I thank you especially for their heart for college students. And I just pray that you would continue uh, to bless this church, God. Uh, Lord, now as we, as we take an offering, I just pray, pray that you would bless these, uh, these monies and these gifts and just do immeasurably more with them than, than the amount, God. We know that's what you're in the business of doing, God. Uh, again, we thank you for all that you do for us. We know that whatever tiny amount we put in can never compare to all that you've done for us. We thank you for loving us, uh, and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. the risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. Whatever men may say, I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice so clear And just the time I need him He is always near He lives He lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me, and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. Do you know he lives? Salvation. Rejoice, rejoice, oh Christians, 
Lift up your voice and sing Eternal hallelujahs To Jesus Christ the King The hope of all who seek Him The help of all who find None other is so loving, so good and kind. Do you know he lives? He lives, Christ Jesus. He lives today. He walks with me. And he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, I'm glad he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how. and care for us that much. Thank you, Gina. Uh, Psalm 27 is a psalm of David. I think it's interesting because in Psalm 27, David writes this. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Whom shall I be afraid of? And then in verse 2, he mentions this. I mean, he mentions some bad things that have happened to him in his life. He says, when the wicked advanced against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. And then he says this in verse 4. He says, the one thing I ask from the Lord, and this only, this only do I seek. He says to that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Isn't it interesting that David, in a time of turmoil, uh, in, a t in his time of, of when he feels attacked, that he doesn't pray, Lord, take this from me. Lord, uh, do something to make this go away. Lord, do something to my enemies. He says, Lord, all, only thing, I just want one thing, just one thing I pray for. I just want to dwell with you in the house of the Lord. He just wanted the Lord. That's all he wanted. He just wanted to be with the Lord. And I don't know what you're going through today. You know, because the great thing about communion is this, that we can kind of push aside all the things that are going through our life. Whether it's uh, family strife, whether it's trouble at work, whether it's cancer, uh, whatever it might be. All we, can, we can come to this point in time and say, Lord, I just want to ask one thing. I just want you. I just want you. And then a great time for us to do that right here in communion. To be able to say, Lord, all I want is you. Because really, in the end, all he really wanted was us. That's why he gave his one and only son to die for each and every one of us. And so as we gather today and partake of communion, as we remember his body and his blood, as we remember his sacrifice for us that he didn't have to do, he didn't have to, he would have been, he would have been righteous enough to be able to stay in heaven and been, that would have been okay but he chose not to do those things, but come into our world and take our sins and our shame upon himself and to die for us. And today, I want to encourage you as you partake, as you remember, I also want you to pray, Lord, all I want is one thing. I just want you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. We thank you for the reminders that we have of what you've done for us. For the cross, for the empty tomb, for this bread and this cup that represent 
your grace and your mercy and your love pours out upon us. And Father God, today we pray that you'd bless us as we partake. That not only do we remember in this moment, but also too, Father God, that we just seek you and you only. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love Jay. Jay always does a great job making sure I get up here on stage. He'll always never go, hey, it's your turn to get up there. So 
Anyway, thanks, Jay, for your awesome buddy. Hey, it's welcome, welcome to Mount Carmel Christian Church. We're glad that you're here. If this is your first time for being with us, we are so glad that you got up this morning. I mean, after all, there's a big game on later on today, and you're missing like the second pregame or show they've got on right now. So we're glad that you're here. We're in the middle of a sermon series that we're calling Full Life. Uh, you know, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. And the incredible thing is that, yes, he did do that for us spiritually. When he, gained, when he came and died for our sins, conquered death, and, you know, uh, one day we're going to have, you know, full life in heaven. You know, one day we'll be more alive uh, I- I- than we've ever have been before. Uh, and uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to enjoy perfect peace, perfect joy, perfect love that we've never really experienced here in this world. And so, yes, he has given us uh, a full spiritual life because of his death burial and resurrection but we also want you to know that while we are in this life while we are going through this spiritual conflict here on this earth we can still have full life in jesus we can still have full life in him yeah it may not be it may not be heaven but this isn't heaven this is earth and we, this is kind of a, a battleground for us and so many times we need to make we need to understand that yes we will have ups and downs but through those downs and even in the ups god can give us full life uh, in him and so that's what we're talking about and so hence you may see the trees up on stage donnie leaned over to me goes hey uh, don't look now but you got some trees growing on your stage and i said yeah and so but just like the trees on stage we want to make sure that you're like the center tree uh, that it looks full and lives full it lives a full life even amidst uh, the, uh, the, the world that we live in here in, in this world. And we're using, of all things, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 as a springboard uh, for this sermon series called Full Life because in 2 Peter, he gives us seven virtues, seven qualities that we need to add to our faith. Now, notice we didn't say that these virtues help us in our salvation. That's a free gift from the Lord. But once we have faith in Christ, we need to continue to add to it so that we are stronger in the faith as we go on, that we walk closer with the Lord. And so he says this, uh, the Apostle Peter does, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. He says, For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love and then he says this in verse 8 for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure and that's important because this means that we don't just one time add these qualities to our life but we continue to add these qualities ongoingly into our lives he says if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our lord jesus christ and so if, uh, if, if maybe you've been out a little bit, you can go back to our website and you can catch some of these videos and, and catch some of the sermons and kind of be caught up to where we're at. But so far, if you're keeping score, we've talked about goodness and how goodness is living life with this moral excellence and how if we live life with a moral excellence, it will help us live a full life. I mean, maybe you probably know family members, uh, uh, co-workers who, have, who haven't lived with the moral excellence and in some way, shape or form, uh, their, their life isn't full because of that. We've also talked about knowledge. And we're not talking about trivia here. We're talking about the knowledge of knowing God and being known by Him. Having a relationship with the Lord. And how this can help us have full life. We also unpack this idea of what it means to, to live with self-control. And we talked about adding to our spiritual disciplines uh, things like reading the Bible, prayer, fasting, solitude. Things, things that we can add to, our, to ourselves that we can develop more and more this idea of self-control, uh, especially in times of, of trial. And then last week, Carlos did a great job, by the way. Carlos, where are you at? Nice job, my friend. Uh, I called, <laughs> when I was in the hospital, I called Carlos. He was the first phone call I made. Uh, Carlos, I'm not going to be there Sunday, man. Can you preach? And he's like, yeah, sure, I can do it. And he said, and he, I said, you can preach about anything you want, man. Uh, cause I really don't give a rip. I'm just, I'm, I'm hurt, you know? And so he's like, he goes, that's okay. He goes, I would like to try perseverance if at all possible. I said, go for it. Did a great job, my friend. Uh, but Carlos unpacked for us what it means to have this perseverance, this, uh, this, this, this stick to in our faith that we don't give up. We don't, uh, we don't uh, fall by the wayside, but we stay close with the Lord. And so that's where we've been. 
And before we go to where, where we're, we're going to be today and hang out most of the time, uh, I just wanted to share this with you. Now, I, most of you may know, some of you may not, uh, we are currently in a 40 days of prayer. Uh, going through the 40 days of prayer. And um, although we need to be praying all the time as believers, we need to always uh, be, be praying. You know, pray without ceasing, Paul says. But we especially thought it would be great for the first of the year for us to devote, the, you know, the, as, as best as we could, the first 40 days uh, to the Lord in prayer and just really uh, uh, focus all of our prayers together in that. And I, and I want to thank you uh, for your participation in that. Thank you for continuing to do that. If you go, oh, I didn't even know we were in this, then that's okay. Just start right now and go. We've got, this is day 26. We've got 14 days left. But um, let, me just, let me just tell you some of the things that I've experienced through this 40 days of prayer because quite honestly, prayer is not easy. I mean, it's tough. It's tough. And, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't think Satan enjoys a church that prays. I know he doesn't enjoy the people of God pray but I know he doesn't enjoy the church praying and he's afraid of a church that prays together he's afraid of a church uh, that, uh, that 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 gets on its knees and prays to God in fact he'll do whatever it takes to stop it and just in my own life just personally as I look through without being uh, uh, too transparent uh, personally in my own life over the past 26 days I have felt attacked by the enemy I don't know if you have or not but I've felt attacked by the enemy um, I, I feel like uh, I have been uh, 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 tempted by the enemy, sidetracked by the enemy. And I don't know if the trip to the hospital was God's idea of slowing me down or Satan's idea of keeping me down. I'm not really sure. But all I know is these, these, these first 26 days of, of, our, of, our, uh, of our 40 day prayer challenge, whew, it's been a doozy. You know, I can't wait to see what happens in the next 14 days. But I'm encouraged by it because what, what, what it means is we're stepping into the enemy's territory. He does not like it at all. He does not like it all. Here's what I want to make sure that you guys know. I want to make sure that we encourage you to continue on. We're going to try this video if it works. The computer's crashed a couple times. This video encouraged me. I sent it to a couple guys that I knew to encourage them, and I wanted, to, wanted, to, wanted it to encourage you as well. Check this out. The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. So today, I will give no place to fear or failure. I will not accept the trace of apathy in my attitude or actions. I will reject complacency and embrace the greatness that God has planted inside of me. I will waste no opportunity to glorify God and maximize everything he has entrusted to me. I will fight. My battle is not against flesh and blood, but against a spiritual enemy who opposes me. So I will draw the battle lines and face my enemy with a bold determination. My enemy fights against me because he fears me. Every time I resist him, he must flee. And every time he reminds me of my past, I will remind him of his future. I will make no excuses, but through every obstacle I will find a way. I will not procrastinate my progress. I will not defer my destiny. I will not waver when I'm weak. I will not cower when my circumstances take a turn for the worse. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I will fight. Even if I lose the battle, I will win the war. Because I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. I will reject the lies that echo in my mind, telling me that I don't have what it takes. That my best is behind me, or that humiliation awaits me. The devil is a liar. And my God always causes me to triumph. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord, I will fight. I'm unashamed to represent a kingdom that is unshakable. No one will be able to stand against God's plan for me all the days of my life. With my God, I will advance against every troop. With his help, I will scale every wall. Though my enemies surround me, my God surrounds my enemies. Though they may come at me one way, they will flee seven ways. Because no weapon formed against me will prosper. And every evil thing that rises against me, I will condemn, I will fight. My heart is steadfast. My purpose is immovable. I am always abounding in the work of the Lord. And my potential is unlimited because the limitless God lives within me. I will fight. The cross is before me. The world is behind me. I'll never turn back. I'll never give up. I'll never settle. I'll never stop short. I will press toward the mark for 
the prize that is already mine. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation shall be able to separate me from my God. And if my God is for me, who can be against me? I will fight. So, for the next 14 days, uh, church, it's time for us to be strong. Let's finish it strong. Let's do that. We've got, uh, we've got a prayer time that we're going to do at the end of that 40 days, starting on Valentine's Day at 1030 a.m. And it's going to end on 1030 uh, Sunday morning as we start our, our, uh, our worship service. And this is what I need you to do. We're going to pray here in the sanctuary. And so we've got some sign-up sheets right down front. I've got a few names on it, but we need more. And so we need you to come down and fill a slot. But here's the kicker. You're not praying at home. We're praying here in the sanctuary. And so it may may mean you have to get up late to get here or or get up early in the morning to get here. uh, Or or maybe it means you need to rush down real quick and sign up the time that nobody takes so you can be here and and be able to pray. But we wanted to do that right here in the sanctuary. You know, yes, we can pray at home. Yes, we can do all those things. But sometimes it's nice to be able to pray in one spot together as believers in Christ. And so that's what we want to do. So we've got a couple weeks until February the 14th. So we really need you guys to sign up and remember your times. We'll try to email this out to you guys so you guys know what time to be here. I'm trying to remind you, but we need you guys to fill this out. To, and so after service, you guys can come down, make sure you guys fill it out. We want to finish strong in this because we know that what, what we're doing, praying, is extremely important. That's where the, that's where the battle is. That's where the battle is, is, is in prayer. And so we want to make sure that you do that. So uh, prepare yourselves for that. If you have wronged anybody, then go to them and say, hey, I'm so sorry. If they have wronged you, then even before they get to you, already forgive them. You know, uh, what, make sure you continue to read your Bible. Make sure you continue to pray. Make sure you continue uh, to obey and be strong. And let's finish this thing out in a strong, strong fashion. Because greater is he who's within us than he who's within and this is how we fight, church. This is how we do that. So, in the commercial, and just thought I was going to share that with you guys as we kind of head into the next 14 days. So, uh, in, um, and maybe it kind of, it'll tie in just a tad here. Well, I say it does tie in big time with what we're talking about today. The idea of godliness. This is interesting. I have really enjoyed uh, uh, studying this, unpacking this. There's more I need to study on this. Uh, and uh, I want to encourage you to do the same. Uh, there's been a couple, of, a couple of great books that I've been able to pick up and, uh, and read, read uh, some things about this. Uh, but I want to encourage you uh, to think about this idea of godliness as we kind of talk about it today. Most of it won't be earth-shattering, but it is something that as, a, as church, as churches, we don't talk about a lot. The, this idea of godliness. And so in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, the Apostle Peter just downloads just for one word this, this, this value, this virtue of godliness. And so what is godliness? What is it? What does it mean to be godly? Well, the Expositor's Bible commentary says that godliness is piety or devotion to the person of God. In his book, Peter and Jude, Green defines it as a very practical awareness of God in every aspect of life. But what is godliness? What is it? Well, godliness means that we are devoted to God. Godliness means that we are devoted to God. And in order for us to get a clear picture about what this means and what this looks like, I want to I go back to the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 5 uh, and also in Hebrews chapter 11 because there's a person there by the name of Enoch that we don't know a lot about, but what we do know about him is very significant because he is a very, very godly man. And this is what it says in Genesis chapter 5 verses 21 and on. It says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. And after he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch had lived 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. He just vanished, went up to be with God. He was gone. Because he and God had such a tight, tight relationship together. He walked faithfully with God 
Then in Hebrews, the writer talks about Enoch, and he says this in Hebrews 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch has, was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. He was commended as one who pleased God. And so Enoch personifies this, this very quality of godliness. And he does so because he walked with God and he pleased God. He walked with God, had a relationship with God, and he pleased God. So what does it mean to be devoted to God, to have a relationship with God, to please him? What does it mean? Well, sadly, I think many of us as believers, um, we kind of trick ourselves into believing that maybe we ourselves are godly. In fact, in in his book, um, The The Practice of Godliness, Jerry Bridges says this, it is sad that many Christians do not have this aura of godliness about them. They may be very talented or personable or very busy in the Lord's work or even apparently successful in some avenues of Christian service. And still not be godly. Why? Because they are not devoted to God. They may be devoted to a vision or to a ministry or to their own reputation as a Christian, but not to God. That's a stinging indictment. Stinging indictment on believers in Christ. But one I think that I believe is sadly true. Sadly true. And if you're thinking, well, I thought I was godly, but I'm not so sure now then uh, maybe that's okay. Don't worry. Don't, don't let your heart be troubled. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know if I'll ever make it or not to be godly. How, how's that ever going to happen? Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be troubled. Because the way we become godly is we spend time with God. In his book, The Practice of Godliness, Jerry Bridges gives us three essential elements of what we need in order to build godliness in our lives. And one of the first pillars he gives to us is the fear of God, and then it's the love of God, and then it's the desire for God. And so we're going to kind of unpack these kind of individually just, just for a brief moment, the brief moment we have together. I wish we had more time to really kind of unpack all this, but really we don't. So the first thing, in order to be godly, is that we need to be God-fearing followers. We need to be God-fearing followers. This, I think, is one of the, the few things that as believers in Christ, for whatever reason, we have jettisoned this, this fear of God. This fear of who he is. Now, when I say fear of God, what I, I don't mean, you know, this, this, you know, kind of crawl out of our skin, afraid of, of, of God, afraid to talk to God, afraid to walk in the sanctuary, afraid to wear a hat in church or whatever, you know, might, you might say that, that kind of, ah, oh, no, I don't know what's going to happen. He'll strike me dead at any moment because that kind of fear is relegated to unbelievers. That kind of fear is relegated to unbelievers, not to, not to believers in Christ. In fact, in first John chapter four, verse 18 uh, it talks about how, deli- how believers have been delivered from the wrath of God. So you and I don't have to worry when we die in this world because we won't face God's wrath. We're going to face his grace and his mercy. We won't face his wrath. We don't have to be afraid of that. And we see in numerous times as Jesus encounters his own followers, his own believers, that he tells them over and over and over again, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. It's me. Remember when Jesus was out walking on the water? Everybody's afraid, thought he was a ghost. And he says, don't be afraid. It's I. And so we know that, that the kind of fear that we're talking about isn't this overwhelming you know, fear that something bad's going to happen to us because God's out there, he's God's watching us and that sort of thing. But the fear that we're talking about, the kind of fear that we're, we're talking about here is the, is the honor and the reverence and the awe of the person of God. Have you ever just sat back and just thought about who God is and how Yeah, he could crush us like a bug, but he chooses to love us and care for us. How big God is, how he holds the universe in his hands, and yet he cares for us and knows the number of hairs that are on our head. Just to think about his person is interesting and how when we do that, he does require our honor and reverence and awe. Theologian John Murray said this in his book, principles of conduct he says it is impossible to be devoted to God if one's heart is not filled with the fear of God it's impossible to be devoted to God if one's heart is not filled with fear of God Isaiah got a chance to see this fear uh, face to face as he uh, in Isaiah chapter 6 he goes to heaven 
and he sees these angels with six wings. Isn't that incredible? We don't go to the store and never get those little figurines. You don't really see them with six wings, you know. But he saw these angels with six wings. And Isaiah says, with two wings they're flying. But with two wings, they're covering their faces. And with the other two, they're covering their feet. That's what it means to have reverence for God. And they were praising God, saying, "Glory, uh, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And so Isaiah got a chance to see what it looked like to really fear God to these angels. You may have heard me say this many times, but um, the only thing I can, I can, the only way I can use to equate this is with my own dad. Uh, I had a great dad growing up. I did. He, uh, he hung out with me and my sister all the time. My dad would, um, I had these little, these little plastic army men. I mean, we, I'd sit for hours and set them up and he'd come in and, 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 and just hang out with me. We'd set up army men and things like that, and you know, we'd play kickball and ride bikes together. And it was—I mean, he's a great dad. He is. He's a great, he's an awesome dad. But then there was those times that I wasn't so awesome and I wasn't so good, and my dad would have to have to lay down the law and drop the hammer. And uh, and and there were times that uh, that my backside uh, didn't feel so good because of what uh, we got what I did. And, and you know, mom would have to say, "Wait till your dad gets home." I hated those words. As much as I loved my dad, I also feared him in some way, shape, or form. Not not as a scare fear, uh, but just I just was in awe sometimes of him because he loved me, he cared for me, but yet also too he was my disciplinarian as well. And I, when I think about when I think about this idea of fearing God, I often think about my dad and what I went through. And so it's interesting to me. In fact, uh, Jerry Bridges says, there is a healthy tension that exists in the godly person's heart between the reverential awe of God in his glory and the childlike confidence in God as heavenly father. And so we need to fear God to be in awe of him, to fear him, to be in awe of him. And I don't think as believers... Too many times we're afraid of God, that we have that fear about him. And how do we develop that? How do we develop that fear? I think it all goes down to focusing in on his person, on who he is. The fact that he's omnipotent, uh, the fact that he's omniscient, uh, the fact that, uh, uh, that he is loving and graceful and merciful, the fact that he is warrior, that he is our king of kings and lord of lords, and all, he's all those things just to focus on his person. And maybe we need to do that more often, just to focus on him. We need to be God-fearing followers. We also, we also, in order to build this godliness within us, we need to be captivated by God's love. We need to be captivated by his love. In fact, the fear of God and, his, and, and being captivated by his love go hand in hand. I'll tell you what I mean here in just a second, but the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, that God is love. God is love. He's the very definition of love. And then he goes on to that in, in those next few verses to tell us, to tell us what God has done to show us that he is love, how he came to this earth to die for us, how he took our sins upon himself, and how he rose again three days later, defeating sin and death. And so a godly person never forgets this. A godly person never forgets that at one time we were enemies of God yet still he loves us. A godly person never forgets that salvation is not an entitlement that should be handled down to us, but it's an act of sheer grace that none of us, none of us deserve. A godly person never forgets that they were at one point in time the object of God's wrath, and yet he gave us love. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, he says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but, it is, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You ever talk to somebody about the Lord and they go, well, I, don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. They look, they look at you like you got two heads, you know, and three eyes. They can't, they can't figure it out about this whole thing about Jesus. And for some, the message of the cross is foolishness. Maybe at one point in time it was foolishness to you. You're like, ah, who needs Jesus? <laughs> Whatever. And later on you realized, oh, I guess I need Jesus. And so I think sometimes we forget what God has done for us. And the people of God knew, especially Paul, out of everybody, Paul knew. He knew he could look at the cross. He could look at the cross. And he could say, God, why, why would you do what you did 
for me. He knew what it meant to be blind to the reality of the message of Jesus Christ. He knew what it meant uh, to, uh, to be a sinner in God's eyes. He knew what it meant to be an enemy of God. And yet he understood, I think as best as he could, the depth of God's love. How God snatched him out of that life and gave him full life. And say, so see, here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. The more we fear the Lord, the more we fear him, the more we appreciate his love. The more we appreciate his love. For Paul, he knew that God didn't have to step in and change his life. But he did. It's a total act of grace, unmerited favor given to Paul. And the more we spend time with the Lord and our reverence and awe begin to deepen in him, the more we realize and appreciate his great love that he has for us. I mean, he didn't have to take it upon himself, my sins and your sins. He didn't have to do that. He didn't have to take my shame and your shame. He could have stayed on his throne in heaven and he would have been righteous for it because of what we have done. Not because of what he had done, but because of what we have done. He would have been righteous to stay in heaven, but he chose not to do that. He chose to give us life by dying for us. And as believers in Christ, we need to be captivated by that incredible love that he gives to us. And the more we fear him, the more we're in awe of him, the more we understand his person, then the more we can understand his incredible love that he has for each and every one of us. To be godly, we need to be God-fearing. We need to be God-fearing followers. We need to be captivated by his love, but we also need to have this desire for God, to thirst for God. Listen to what the psalmist says in Psalm 42. It says, As a deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Listen to this. When can I go and meet with God? That's the way we all should be as believers in Christ, desiring God, panting for God, thirsting for God, desiring to be with God. Then he also says in Psalm 27, 4, as we just read a little bit ago, One thing I ask from the Lord, and this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. David had this intense desire for the Lord. It wasn't, it wasn't just him, though. It was Paul as well. Paul even says in Philippians 3.10, he says, I want to know Christ. So much so, he says, I want to know what it's like for it to be in persecution just like him. I guess the question is, do we have a deep desire to know the Lord? To seek diligently after him, to be a godly person, to be godly people that are seeking after him hard. Do you consider everything else rubbish, garbage, trash, compared to knowing Jesus Christ? Do we? Do we? As followers of Christ, as believers in Christ, we need to recognize what it looks like to be a godly person. And we need to assess ourselves and look at the guy in the mirror and say, hey, what's up? Are you godly or are you not? And then if we're not, then we just need to develop this idea of godliness. If we are, then we need to continue to develop that godliness within our lives. In his book, The Practice of Godliness, Jerry Bridges says this, Godliness is never austere or cold. Such an idea comes from a false sense of legalistic morality that is erroneous, or erroneously called good godliness. The person who spends time with God radiates his glory in a manner that is always warm and inviting, never cold and forbidding. This longing for God also produces a desire to glorify God and to please him. Godly people are warm and they're inviting. They radiate God's glory. They please God. They please him. So how do we become godly? How do we do this? How do we build this? Well, we build it one step at a time. One step at a time. By being God-fearing followers. Getting back to what's really important. The person of God. Focusing on who he is and what he's done for us. Being captivated by his love for us. His great and mighty love. 
how he did something for us that he didn't have to do, but chose to do because he cared for us. And when we do those two things, when we fear God and we love God, you know what happens? Our desire for God begins to ratchet up. Our desire for, to know him begins to ratchet up more and more and more. All because we begin to focus in on being godly people. Could you imagine, church, what it would look like to be a godly church? Can you imagine what that would be like to be a warm, fighting church? I think we are. We're getting there at least. We're never going to arrive, but yet we're, we're, we're walking down that road. But yet, nonetheless, what would it look like for us to ratchet that up in our own lives? Because the more we do this individually, the more collectively as a church we seek hard after him. The more we desire him, the more he begins to bless us. Walk with God. Walk with God, church, and please him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you because that you're faithful even when we're unfaithful. <laughs> I don't know how that works, Father. I don't know how, that, how you do that, but you do. And so, Lord God, we come before you and we praise you. We lift you up. We thank you for the fact that you love us and care for us. Not equal to how we love and care for you, but you love and care for us in a great measure, a measure that we can never match. But yet, Father God, we, we recognize that as, as believers, we don't fear you like we ought to. That we are not as God-fearing as we need to be. That there are many times we don't hold you in reverence and awe. And so, Lord God, forgive us of those times, but help us. Help us to build that sense of awe that we should have in you. And Lord, help us to re remember your great and mighty love and to be captivated by it. To be blown away by what you've done for us in our lives. And how you extended grace and mercy so freely to us, Father God. How out of all the people in the world, on this planet, that we got a chance to hear your gospel message and a chance to respond. Thank you, Father God, for that. And Lord, we pray that as a church, that our desire for you would grow and grow and grow and grow as we spend time with you, as we encourage one another, as we help each other out, as we pray for one another, as we speak kind words to each other, as we give hugs and handshakes, and as we encourage one another in their daily lives. Help us to have a bigger desire for you father god that we might walk with you and that we might please you it's in jesus name that we pray amen i want to give you an opportunity today if you've never accepted jesus christ as lord and savior i'll be right down front i would love to share with you about who he is his person and how he came to this earth to die for you and how you can give your life to him if you're already a believer and you just say, hey, this is where we want to plant our flag, this is where our family wants to be, and we want to put our membership here, then I'll be down front. I would love to speak with you. And if you just need prayer, if you just need prayer, I encourage you to come. And then afterwards, as we're all said and done, I encourage you to come down, fill out a time slot. You know, only about 10 minutes. You can, you can do 10, 20, 30, however much you want. But I think it would be great for us as a church to finish strong as we head into this uh, the end of our 40 days of prayer. Won't you come as we stand, as we sing? Into my heart, into my heart, come into my heart, Lord Jesus, come.
so hang on for a second here. So. <laughs> She's almost there. We're, we're excited they come forward today to, to join the church, to plant their flag here, serve alongside of us, and woo, she's done. That, that paper's hot. I like it. So. <laughs> I'm going to introduce you to Robert and April, and I'm going to give their kids, because they've got the most beautiful kids I've ever seen in my life, oh my goodness. Um, their kids are Hannah and Haley, Brandon and Isaiah. They're downstairs right now in Children's Church. Maybe you see them on Sunday, on, on Wednesday nights a lot, and so we're just like, super excited you guys have come to uh, plant your flag here at Mount Carmel. We're excited. We're trying to reach this, this community for Christ, and you guys are a big part of that, and so we're super excited what God's going to do uh, with you, through you, and with all of us as well. And we ask you to repeat the same confession the Apostle Peter made such a long time ago. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is Christ, the Son of the living God, Son of the living God my Lord and Savior. My Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Let's give them a hand today. And let me just let me just say it is it's not easy to come down front, is it? And Christi Christine comes down front just for prayer. She's had some some health difficulties, and so we want to continue to to pray for Christine as well. And so we invite you to make sure that uh, you keep Christine in your prayers. Not only Robert and April, but uh, and their family, but but all those uh, that we uh, that are here and that we have yet to reach as well. And we're excited to be able to do that. Let me pray for us as we close out our service today. Father God, I thank you. Lord, thank you so much for wonderful servants of Christ that come to, that you've drawn in, Father God. You've drawn here. And Father, we pray for April and Robert that you would bless them. Lord, that you would bless their children, that you bless their business. Lord, that uh, they would just simply serve you each and, each, each and every day, in and out, Lord God. And Father, we pray that in the next days and weeks to come, that they lean upon us for strength and that we, we lean upon them for strength, Father God, as we together uh, live life for you and live life to its fullest. And Father, for Christine, we lift her up to you, Lord God. Father, we just pray for her and many others that are on our prayer list, that you give them strength, you give them healing, Lord God, and that you would just bless them to serve you in, in, the, in the ups and downs of life. And so, Father God, we thank you for them today. Lord, thank you for your power. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. And bless us now as we go out these doors and we share all of that with those that are around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. amen, amen. Come on, everybody, sing this with a sing. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see. I want 